How are we? Refreshed? Now, um, a few of you had some questions before we uh, stopped. If we go behind Advana. <laughs> Sorry, Advana. And then we'll come down to you. So, so. yep, so, and then Ange, so. AJ, this is so great and so timely. Is it? Thank you, absolutely. Two weeks ago, I decided it is time to challenge myself. Yeah. I've got a 60th birthday coming up in 10 days' time, and I've already decided I'm going to do a sky jump. Ah, uh, okay. And what I want to know is who wants to come and join me? Ah. <laughs> There's one taker, two takers. So, so I'll uh, come and see me at the end because I really... Four takers. In, and, and I own, it's a way to lock me in of making me do it. Uh, <laughs> well, if you all die doing it... <laughs> Thanks. Don't blame me. <laughs> um, and, and I have a question. In the past, I've done like the helicopter thing. I've been out in the ocean in a kayak with another who I didn't know. Yep. And prayed like mad in the process. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, I didn't, did I really face my fear? Or was that a bit of a spiritual you-know-what? Yeah, a lot of times <laughs> what happens is we get into a place of fear and we pray like mad, pray like mad, pray like mad. But actually what God wants us to do in that moment is to feel the fear and terror and work your way through it. So, so actually the prayer that you're giving in that moment is not really in harmony with what God wants you to do in, a, in any way. The key, the key to go into this is, right, I set my intention. I set my intention to deal with the fear that I have that I know is preventing me from making changes. So what I do is I set my intention. I want to make positive changes. I, I have a goal. I do something to trigger it. But make sure that when you do it that you don't use your old techniques to get out of the fear. Allow the fear to be triggered. If you allow the fear to be triggered, what will happen is after the event, many cases, um, you will sort of go into this almost state of sort of shock state. And the key is to breathe all the way through that and allow that just to rise in you and come through you. Um, you can easily pray yourself out of it. Mind you, you're not receiving help from God in those places because when we pray to get out of our fear, we're actually praying to avoid an emotion. And therefore, whoever is helping us calm down is not God. All right, so God doesn't want you to avoid an emotion. God wants you to actually address and release all of your emotions. So, so when, if you're fully God-reliant in this situation, what will happen is you will allow the fear without judgment. So what, and if you're worried about the judgment, you can preempt a lot of judgment by talking to the people who will help you. So, so let's say you're going skydiving and you're on the back of someone or on the front of somebody and you just say, look, like, there's a chance that I'm going to go in a lot of fear and that's my purpose of doing this. And so when I start shaking and everything, instead of trying to stop me, allow me to go through it, even if it means just pack me in the back of the wagon and take me, <laughs> take me back to <laughs> put me in my car and just let me do it, you know, let me feel it. And during that place, the key thing that I always remember with dealing with fear is that while I'm feeling the emotion of it and, while I'm, and, and I'm breathing, and, I'm, and in that moment pray to God to help you get to the bottom of it rather than to help you avoid it. You see, most of the time when we direct uh, prayers to God about our terror and our fear, we're actually asking God to help us avoid it as an emotion rather than to experience it as an emotion. So if you pray in harmony with what God wants you to do, that to experience it as emotion, you'll feel that assistance come to you. You'll be able to experience it. But also you can remind yourself during the experience, not to get out of the emotion, but to remind yourself just, I'm an adult and I'm allowed, I can do this now. I can feel this feeling to the end now. I can actually go through whatever this is about for me. And ironically, you'll find that a lot of terrors that exist inside of you actually have nothing to do with your own terror so much as they have everything to do with your parents' terror that you took on, not the actual terror that you took on emotionally, but their actual judgment of the terror that you took on emotionally. Now, it's hard to explain, so let's try to give you an idea of what I mean by that. Here's you as the child, right? Sorry, dress for yourself, so I better get my gender right. And again, it's a bit too short, so I have to just do... 
And so here, here's your mum and her terror. Does that make sense? But what happened is your mum has terror within her. That is not necessarily going to enter you until there's some kind of emotional bond on the terror between the two of you. There has to be some kind of hook into mum's terror that causes you to go into a terrified state. And that is usually an emotional set of beliefs that, uh, so there's a set of emotions that are beliefs inside of you that you took on about your mum in order to get your mother's approval or your mother's acceptance. So it could be your dad's, of course, or it could be anybody else. So what happens with a lot of our terrors is they're not actually that we're afraid of something specific, but we're afraid of our mother or father's response to that thing. Mm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Which is a very, very different state. And so, so um, for example, the child may pick up a spider and look at the spider. At that moment, the child is not afraid of the spider, even though its mother is. Right? But now when the mother comes and yells at the child and smacks its hand and gets the spider out and kills the spider and does all of that stuff, what is the mum now? There's now an emotional interaction. I can't love spiders. I have, to, I have to be afraid of spiders to get my mother's approval. Does that make sense? So now there's an emotional hook into my mother's terror of spiders. Which, which, so you'll find with a lot of your fears that many of them will turn out not being what you thought they were about. Right? That they'll actually be related to childhood events that are not, or, or, or something that happened between yourself and your parents that has nothing to do with the spider itself or with the, or the fear of heights, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah. And more about the emotion of approval or acceptance that you needed from your mother or father. So, so if you understand that, you will not go into this thinking, I'm afraid of heights. Rather, you will go into it say, saying, all right, I'm afraid of something here that was something to do with my parents' emotions that causes me to link heights with this deep fear or terror about dealing with this emotional link. Do you, do you see the difference? And I know I'm not probably stating it as accurately as I could. Um, does everyone understand what I'm saying there? Like, yeah. um, because it, um, it's, it's really important to understand the difference between those two things. Often, often we are not afraid of the thing we think we're afraid of. We're rather afraid of the, our parents' emotional response to the thing we're afraid of. <laughs> right? or, so, so my parent has an emotional response projected at me. So he, let's say my parents are afraid of spiders, right? Right? And they have an emotional response, but instead of them owning their own emotional response of terror of that spider, what they did is they come along and browbeated me, browbeat me into submission about the same issue, causing a huge fear of my parent in this process. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually now afraid of this raving lunatic, afraid of this thing that was fine on my hand before they began. Do you know what I mean? So the spider was fine sitting there on my hand. I was looking at and yeah, it's got a red stripe down its back, but that's fine, right? And, and I was fine with that at that moment. The child, the spider wasn't biting me. It was just crawling over me. It wasn't causing me any harm at this particular moment. But what's happened is the terror of the parent. There might be the terror that, oh, my child might die. What will happen if my child dies? You know, and they go into all this fear and terror. And what, instead of owning it all inside of themselves, they projected all of that as rage or fear at me. And now there's a linkage between the spider and my parents' rage and, and fear and terrified feelings. AJ, does it need to be as specific as that or could it just be my mother's terror of opening into the world and being out in the world? Um, you have to be very careful of actually intellectualising this yeah, process because what will happen, this is what I'm really saying to you here, mm. the, the reason why is that often this emotional link is totally different than what you'd think. Okay. And this is where you need to be prepared to feel the terror because underneath the terror is the link. Do you, do you follow me? So, so if you can think of your terror as the cover, so that's the cover feeling, to the real feeling that you need to feel, the, the grieving feeling, if you like, that you need to feel, right? And that's, that's the cover. Now, you can intellectualise all you like about mm -hmm. what that might be about, mm -hmm. but while you're doing that, you're actually not prepared to feel it, the terror itself, I mean. If you become prepared to feel the terror itself 
and allow whatever is underneath to come up as a result, what will happen is often some grief will surface and you'll find that it's actually nothing to do with what you thought it was about. Right? And the key is to not judge that, just to feel it in that, in that situation. And usually after you feel it, then you know what it was all about. For example, I, I told you this. I used to have runny nose all the time, like hay fever all the time. Any time I got around a cat, it would just go, whoa, really bad, taking antihistamines every four hours all the time, all that stuff. Not realising in the end, all I had to do was sit with the cat and feel what I was afraid of. And in the end, it got down to my fa father shoots cats. Like, and, and if I love the cat, I don't have his approval. So once I started processing about how much I didn't have my father's approval to actually disagree with him on a matter, I released the emotions about the cat. As it, so I, I'm there thinking intellectually it's about the cat. And I'm allergic to cat. Why am I allergic to cat? So you, can think, you can think all your way through that as much as you like. But if you sit with the fear and allow yourself just to feel what it's about and you'll connect with the fact that there's something underneath it and a lot of times what's underneath it is something to do with your parent or parents. But it's a real like obscure and very difficult to intellectually discover until you actually experience the emotion of terror and then the underlying emotion that it's covering. So am I hearing you saying not to try and feel that before I do the jump, but that might be revealed in the process? What will be revealed in the process is if you breathe through the jump and you allow yourself to feel the terror and when you go, get up in the, after the jump, you know, when he's <laughs> lifted you up off the deck when you're up there, <laughs> um, hopefully when you're not splat on the deck, but you listen. And I'm saying these things purposely Thanks. to you. And, <laughs> and, and you lift it up like, and, and, you, and you feel it, allow yourself to shake, allow yourself to feel the feeling and allow yourself to breathe like you need to breathe. And, Allow yourself to breathe and feel those feelings and shaking and whatever and allow yourself to feel them for as long as they're there and just pray about just getting deeper underneath this. What's this about? And you'll be surprised what comes up. And a lot of times I'm saying that your intellectual knowledge about what you think it's about is totally different than what it was actually about. Like, there's no way I would have arrived at my dad's approval with regard to my allergies to cat. I firmly believed that I had an allergy to cats due to some physiological reason inside of myself. Does that make sense? Mm. And, the, and the key is to allow these connections to occur without you having to, to determine them beforehand. So, so desire the positive change, so that is taking the action to trigger the fear, that's a positive change. So that's desiring it, but allow the process, and we'll talk about this in a minute, allow the process God reliance in the process, that, that if you are prepared to positively and passionately desire a, a changed outcome, what will happen is that God will show you through the mechanism that you are, you are now challenging, God will show you, if you're God reliant, God will show you what it's all about rather than you having to think what it's about. Because often when you think what it's about, you arrive at a totally different conclusion and the actual emotion you need to feel is gone and, and needs to be accessed at a different time. The law of attraction, of course, will demonstrate that to you. So if you jump out of the plane this time, right, and don't get into anything very much and still feel afraid about jumping out of a plane, then obviously the, uh, the emotion isn't dealt with. And so that particular thing you did didn't work. But look at, if that's the case, look at what was I trying to intellectually determine before I made choice. Yeah, because I was just going to ask you, I wonder if, is there a point when adrenaline might kick in and then it becomes exciting? <laughs> um, <laughs> fear and excitement are very much related to each other in terms of physiological response. So obviously th there are many times when I, like, where I believed I was afraid when I was actually excited. And, um, and so, you know, this is why a lot of people become junkies to fear junkies is because they feel they're creating excitement when there's fear related and vice versa. The key is to just allow the emotional experience. So yeah, you might actually enjoy it, right? But then if you're addicted to it, like many are, and they do a thousand jumps, well, you've got to start looking at, all right, sure. why am I addicted to this process now? There's something going on there that, wh why do I have to go out and jump out of a plane every weekend? Mm -hmm. There's something going on for me there too. You know, why can't I enjoy a variety of experiences besides that one experience? 
So, mm -hmm. so either way, there's just emotions to feel. So you can easily switch from fear to excitement to addiction, adrenaline, but that's not what we're doing. What we do here, what we want to do is get to the underlying emotion. The main reason, by the way, that many men choose to do dangerous things is because they're actually trying to work through issues of fear as excitement. Do, do you follow me? Like, mm. And there's a lot of emotions in that. There's a lot of emotions that need to be healed in that. So the key is to understand that actually the emotion that causes my fear of this thing may be totally different than anything I can intellectually conceive of at this moment. Right? So stop trying to conceive it. Just I know the fear exists of heights. Let's address the fear of heights by trying to challenge it. Let myself breathe and feel the emotions and allow myself to shake and all those kind of things that might happen during this process. Scream, shake, whatever you need to do. And, and tell the person who's doing it with you, this might happen and you need to allow it to happen. Does that make sense? But remind me to breathe. Mm. Just tell me to breathe and, and allow myself to feel it. Just tell me that. Right. Just even talking about it, I'm sweating and shaking and sweating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So use a lot of work you can do on this before you even go. Can you see that? Just, just me speaking about it like this brings up. And things, even so. that being vulnerable and saying I'm feeling really scared is is a challenge as well to name that and have it be out there. Yeah, and it may actually be linked to the fear you actually have. You see, a lot of times these things are. You'd be surprised how many times. You know, somebody says something to me and I say, oh, well, if you do with this emotion, but often the emotion I'm talking about right at the moment is actually related to the fear and the related to, in your case, the fear of height. So what I'm saying is your fear of speaking up to a man and telling him, because it's most likely a man you're probably going to jump out of the thing with, right? Your fear of speaking up to a man and telling him that you're going to be perhaps for aid and all that is about speaking up to your dad and telling him you're afraid when he yells and screams at you. And do you, do you see the relationship? And that may be what this is all about in the end. But you need to, instead of just saying, oh, that's what AJ said it's about, stop all even that and just go into the process and allow the process to, to demonstrate to you what it's about. And, and, and then overcoming the fear of exposing it and the fear then of being punished because I've exposed it. Yeah, so if you get a guy who acts really badly towards you, the, you know, the jump fellow that you're jumping with, law of attraction. If, if it, then that's your law of attraction. Don't jump with him and go home and, and experience your emotion about that. Do you know what I mean? Just say, I can't jump with you if you're going to shut me down like that and go home and then feel about being shut down and everything because that's a part of the fear that's going on here. Does mm. that make sense? Oh, so, absolutely. So yes, own, own it at every stage and eventually you'll be able to jump and, and feel the terror and the fear and so forth. Yeah. So. Thank you. So yes. if anybody wants to join me, come and talk yeah. to me. So you want to stand up so everyone who wants to join you can... <laughs> all right, so you know who you're talking to? Yeah. Um, Ange, can we come across it? Just down there. Thank you. No worries. Uh, I was going to ask a question, but I think I answered it for myself in the break. But yep. I'll just... Um, I had the question, if I'm so terrified of these things in my awake state, how come I can, like, fly backwards in my sleep state? But I figured it's not, it's not anything to do with the fear of hot... I feel it's more to do with the fear of what's going to happen to my body. Yes. It's a, phys it's a physical fear of my own body, which I know what it relates back to in my childhood. Yes. Yeah. Often we, if we have uh, the fear not present in the sleep state, but it's there in the awake state, then it means that actually it's about your body in some way. It's safety. Yeah. And a lot of times that's related to punishing events that have happened to your body by your parents. Pardon me, by your parents or, 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 or other, you know, school and other things like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I, when I get terrified of um, rides and things, I always throw up at the end. Yeah. And I've noticed that when I um, process my sexual abuse, I always throw up at the end. Right. So I sort of thought, well, okay, that's probably... So f some related feelings there somehow. Terror, yeah. Like, yeah, terror-related terror feelings. Terror of what's going to happen to my body. Yeah. So, uh, so the truth is that we have, particularly if we've had abuse in the past, we have a lot of very protective feelings about our body. And we finish up avoiding a lot of things in our life because we uh, avoid what might happen to our body. So we're dictated by fear, unfortunately. A child doesn't go away and wondering whether it's going to step on a nail or not, you know. It doesn't. Like, you know, you, mummy, your, mum are always, your mums are always saying, don't, 
you've got to wear shoes, you've got to wear shoes, like, you're going to step on something. You know, the child doesn't think it's got to wear shoes, <laughs> you know. And this is the thing, is that once we get into total trust of everything that's going on, and once we release all of the stuff, the fear and everything related, we won't step on those things that are going to harm us in any way. So it's just automatic that we'll miss them. And uh, that's, that'll be our law of attraction. So, so any time that's not happening, it's obviously related to. So that tells me I have more fear of my physical body problem than in the sleep state. Yes. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So the key is to work through physical body fears. Yeah. M many of us have physical body fears, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I had for most of my life a fear of stepping on nails um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> like, and ironically, I, I trod on quite a number. And so one of them went straight through my foot, like, as a result of fear, which just heightened the fear. And so we need to process the fear and release it, then you know, those kind of things don't happen. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll go across over that way. Um, just with addiction, um, it kind of clicked to me today, but I'm probably, I'm an incredibly scared person and I do have a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. um, and growing up, I was obsessed with, like, horror movies, scary movies, mm -hmm. watched them all the time, um, and, like, scary rides, that type of thing. Like you were saying, with the addictive yeah. type of state. And yeah. so whenever I watch a scary movie now, I'm always like, oh, that is so fake. And, oh, that <laughs> ride wasn't scary. Yeah. And it's just a way of um, suppressing that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. A lot of uh, people watch horror movies as a as enjoyment and then they laugh at them yeah. and you see them uh, not connecting emotionally to the actual feeling of terror about the horror itself and uh, the reason why they do that is because they're trying to constantly get Deny. away from that emotion yeah yeah which is why there's a huge market for horror movies yeah. yep. that's all i wanted to say <laughs> no worries if you pass your mic straight back and then we'll go we'll make our way over that way my name is Lynn. I have two questions today. Yep. Um, and I hope that you and everyone can see that this is coming from a place of trying to understand as a, as a place, as to a place of um, criticism. Yep. Um, my first question is, um, there's a, a line in the Bible that states, be still and know I am God. Yep. Can you please talk to us about what you think that is, because I won't elaborate, but I think it means be still and know I am God. Yep. That God, I am as much God as everyone else is. Does that make sense? That God is me, I am God. It's all, it's all the same energy. So, how many, of, how many of the DVDs have you actually listened to? I have not, haven't listened to any of them. Okay. I've missed my first time here today. No worries. And my suggestion is that you have a listen to them because I state very categorically that we are not God. Um, so that is a, going to be a sticking point for you right from the beginning of me giving you an answer on the question. Um, the truth is God is an entity that exists before we existed and will continue to exist even if we didn't exist. So therefore we are not God and uh, we can become at one with God as a child of God. But rather than me, uh, most of the people who are here have heard all of this from me before, so rather than me reiterate that, I was, I'd perhaps recommend that you have a listen to, uh, which is the Secrets of the Universe recordings? September? September, September there's something. If it, yeah, if somebody makes a DVD for you, and some of those questions will be answered then perhaps after, after you've watched that DVD, perhaps if you've still got more questions, maybe we can address them in a more public forum. Is okay, right? thank you. My second um, statement, question, um, is that um, in many ways when I hear you say, I am Jesus, I don't have a, a problem with you saying that. Mm. I, I think in many ways it's a very limiting statement because you are not just Jesus. You are, and in fact, I think in many ways it would be more accurate for all of us to just say, I am, yep. instead um, of I am Jesus or I am Lynn or I am a, a female or I, because it limits, it's so limiting by saying that because you are not just Jesus. Lynn, you are, your questions are being guided by some of your unhealed emotions. And, and so 
that and and I know you look at me and project at me, by the way. But I didn't understand. <laughs> uh, I don't I, understand when I say that. What you mean that? Well, firstly, um, many people try to avoid the issue that I am actually saying I'm Jesus, the first century Jesus, who who incarnated in the first century, lived a life for two thousand years, and then now has reincarnated and and now lived and and now lived now up until this point. And I'm saying that there is also my soulmate, Mary Magdalene, who's done the same thing, and. It's easy to avoid those emotions that you feel by actually intellectualising my comments rather than feeling about the comments. So if you were feeling about the comments, you would start looking at, oh, I don't believe this guy's... Like, this is your feelings, if I can no, tell I, you. No, it's not that I don't believe you. I actually believe... I believe that... Why would you not be Jesus? We are all... It's, it's in all of us. So, of course, it's in you. Yeah, well, the, yeah, well you and I have totally two different viewpoints about that. And, uh, and that is the way that you get over the emotion. And that's what I'm saying to you. The way you skip over the emotion is that intellectual statement that you just made. And but but I th that's not a, a, an intellectualization for me. That's a feeling. That's a, I, I feel that we are all light and dark and good and bad. And, but that's and not true either. See, we have a lot of different uh, like feelings about what's true and not true. My feelings are that you certainly can have dark within you. Yes. But you don't have to have. No, that's right. But we are all, we are all light and dark. We are, we, you can only be light if there is dark. There cannot be dark. No, light see, is only a comparison to darkness. No, that's not true either. I feel that everyone on the planet and everyone in the universe can be light and there be no darkness. Mm -hmm. So God created us in such a manner. And you come from this background of wanting duality. But we're getting right off to our topic, um, and so we need to get back on our topic. If, if you can have a listen to the first DVDs, you'll, you will see a presentation of what I've presented, and then you'll have probably quite a lot of questions to ask about it, and I'd be happy to answer them, but not in the forum where most of the people here have already had them answered for themselves. Does that make sense? Because all we're doing now is having a personal interaction that's off the topic that nobody else here is connecting to, because everyone else here has heard all of those answers and worked their way through many of the emotions surrounding them, if that makes sense to you. Is that right? So um, somebody has offered to copy those DVDs for you. and yep. Now, you feel quite upset with me as well. But you don't, no, I'm telling you, you do. And <laughs> no, but you are, and this is what I'm saying. Is that, is, that, is that you are using intellectual arguments to skip over quite a lot of different emotions because anybody around you can actually feel that emotion that you just projected. And once you become more sensitive to the emotion that's getting projected, you will know what emotion is coming out of you and emotions coming out of others. And, and this is something that is, is a part of what I'm teaching people. And while you may disagree with me totally, as I know perhaps that you do at the moment, and in time, if you, if you allow yourself to investigate more thoroughly, you may find something completely different than what you expected. Many of, these, many of these feelings you have are based around trying to marry Christian beliefs with, with New Age beliefs, both of which have errors that are not based around truth. But, but, and many here in the audience in the past, haven't you, have all tried to do the same thing and have been very confronted with everything I've said to you during the process, have you not? So how many of you haven't been confronted? Uh, there's a few, there's three, <laughs> four or five. There's only a few. The rest have been very confronted with everything I've said up front to them uh, for the same reason that you will feel. And that is that the, we often have some, we've often come to some conclusions inside of ourselves as to what the truth is. And we marry these different beliefs that we feel have truths involved. But we don't realise that actually many of the reasons why we have feelings of truth is because we have a spirit with us who also feels that particular thing to be true. So for many of the people here, they have come along with a lot of preconceptions of what might be truth, and then on top of that, attracted a group of spirits with them who also f firmly believe those truths. And then when I confront something as being uh, as not being the truth, straight away, half, you know, most of those people react, "Oh, I can't listen to this. I can't," you know, and they get into all of that kind of emotion. But in reality, there is a lot of stuff going on underneath that. Part of it is that my own emotional beliefs of why I want to hold on to those beliefs, then there's also the spirits that surround me that I've attracted to me who also want to hold on to that set of beliefs because that's what they believe is true. And then there's also the, 
environmental stuff of me wanting to marry what I've investigated throughout my life, trying to merge the truths that I feel uh, I've learnt through my life, many of which have truth in them. So, so the statement that you said of, of you know, becoming like God has truth in it, but it, but it is not the truth. And so, and, and, and many of the other statements you made to me have truth in it, but they are not truths. And, and I'm perfectly happy to discuss what the truth is, but if you look at those first couple of presentations, it'll help you come to terms with some of the truths that, that I've been teaching and, and see how you feel about them then, is my feeling. And, uh, and some of your questions will be answered as to what I feel about those particular things. I feel that you may not want to do that at the moment based on this little discussion, but that's also your choice. Um, if, I, if I was you, just allow yourself to be open enough to, to maybe investigate that there's, there's a lot going on here that I'm trying to marry up with things, when in reality what I need to do is just say, well, no, that's just not true and this is true. Because a lot of the times what we do in our life is we try hard to put all of these truths together and then we come up with a resolution inside of us, but actually it's just to calm an emotion. And, and the emotion is, how do I ever find truth? How do I ever discover it? How do I know for certain what it is? And there's all answers to those questions, but um, often we have emotions driving the questions. And one of the emotions driving your question about my identity is the emotion that, that you can't accept that I am actually the physical person who was was born in the first century and had that experience and had the experience through the spirit world. And what you would like to do with that emotionally is to come up with something that you can still listen to me about. And my suggestion is to not do that. My suggestion is actually do something completely different and actually confront the emotional feeling inside of you of what, it, what, what happens inside of you when I do say, I am Jesus, I am that person. And what is actually happening inside of me when I say that? So, so allow yourself to feel those emotions and you'll find that, like, if you want to know what Jesus taught in the first century, all you need to do is ask me because I am Jesus, <laughs> right? Now, I know that might be, sound very simplistic, um, but, but the truth is that I, you know, I remember all that life, I, just like you remember all of yours, and I remember my life in the spirit world, just like if you had it, you would remember all of your life in the spirit world as well. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I can answer the questions of what I actually did teach. What I did teach, though, is very different to what you believe to be true at the moment. That's, does that make sense? Well, you think it's my truth, and that's fine. Yep. I know you accept it as my truth, but I'm not saying it's my truth. I'm saying, and I'm claiming, that it's God's truth. Now, whether you accept that or not is about emotions and about whether you can determine what God's truth is or what it isn't. God is an entity which you don't believe, but God is an actual entity that has truth of the universe. And that truth is able to be given to you under certain conditions. And when you have that truth into you, you will know for certain whether God is an entity or not and, whether, and the other statements that you were making. Now, I know at the moment you want to believe that, that you know, this is my truth and I'm not saying it's my truth. This is why most people have trouble with me because I'm not saying that it's my truth. I'm saying it's God's truth. And, and I'm saying that's why I've come, that's why I've returned, is to help God's truth come, become known to the world again, just like the others of, who have reincarnated have done the same thing. And, and until, I can come to, until a person listening comes to terms with that, most of the time they want to reject what I'm saying. And you're perfectly able to reject it with the words, it's my truth. But I'm not claiming that. I'm actually claiming that it's God's truth. So we need to be, you know... We need to understand what I'm actually claiming. Um, now, you don't have to listen to it, and I'm perfectly happy with your desire to not listen to it or listen to it, depending on what you want to do. But I am saying that it is God's truth. And I also am saying that sooner or later you will come to see that by, emotionally, by going through an emotional experience. So how many of you, just for yourself, how many of you, when you first came to hear years, a year or two ago, felt like, oh, that's his truth? but it's not God's truth. How many, how many of you felt that? So there's quite a few. How many of you felt, oh, what's, what I'm hearing is God's truth, but I don't know why he knows that? Like, so there's quite a lot of people who feel that as well. So everyone has started with a lot of different emotions about this 
and my suggestion is to allow yourself to see that that's the case. And many of the people here have made huge investigation into everything I've said um, in order to determine what they feel about it emotionally. And my suggestion is to allow yourself to do the same. Um, but it's just a suggestion. Yeah. Kelly, you can go back to... Um, I've got, you know, lived my life with, in so many fears mm -hmm. and um, my question is, do I, like, say, I've got a fear of sailing around the world solo or travelling around the world on my own, fending for myself, my safety, and so I understand what the lady was saying so around my body and safety. You said sailing around the world, <laughs> but it has to be solo. Yeah. And what was the other one? Travelling around the Traveling world. Travelling around, but again it was so solo. Right? <laughs> Don't you see there's a certain pattern here? Yes. So what's the pattern? My safety and looking after myself and being able to do that for myself. And being alone. And being alone. Um, and I can see where I've lived my life very much from that fear. Mm -hmm. But do I need to go out and sail around the world solo and travel around by myself? To conquer it. You no, know? you'll find a lot of your fears have a common denominator. Yeah. And if you know what the common denominator is, like aloneness, then why not put yourself, like, go out and spend some time in a tent for a week and feel the aloneness? Yeah. You know, without yeah. the mod cons and without the <coughs> telly and without the thing that helps you get out of the aloneness. Yeah. You, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So allow yourself to go into that state of, all right, I've got no telly, I've got no books to read, I've got no. I'm just sitting here. What do I do? Like, let yourself yeah. feel the aloneness of that. And, and you'll find that when you do, uh, some fears will come up and some terrors will come up and you'll release it. And, and in, interestingly enough, you won't be afraid of a whole slew of things. Yeah, that, that was sort of my question. Like, um, mm. is there, it's sort of like a fear of death, uh, something relating back to my childhood, mm -hmm. um, that do I need to go and do them all physically, but it's something you know, that relates back. Yeah, and a lot of times the truth is that you can actually place yourself in a very safe circumstance but tune into the, the feeling quite easily mm. and go through the feeling. Yeah. A lot of times what I'm saying, though, about fear is that we avoid doing that and so why not then make a choice to do the other thing that triggers some fear? You know, if you're really positively wanting change, then let yourself do that, Yeah, you know. But yes, uh, most of us have a long list of 25 different things or more physically that we're afraid of. Many of them are related to emotions, related to our childhood with our parents. Um, and once we hit on a common denominator, we can easily trigger that. Yeah. So um, allow yourself to do that. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Hey, Jay, just while you're on the subject of um, fears around physical harm, mm -hmm. how do you suggest confronting a fear of sharks? Go swimming in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I find myself just reluctant to go past my hips ah, <laughs> in doing we'll go that. a bit deeper. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, then, but the key is to not uh, get yourself out of the fear. The key is to get into it, right? So that means staying breathing, staying connected to yourself, staying connected to the emotion of it, not avoiding it by trying to intellectually reason yourself out of it. Oh, there wouldn't be any sharks here. What am I so afraid of anyway? You know, and all those kind of things. Don't do all of that. Just allow yourself to do the opposite. The problem is, as adults, we have so much judgment of childlike emotion, right? So many of us here are still judging emotion uh, and particularly childlike emotion. So, so, example, if a child's up here skipping, right, so he's skipping along, skipping along up here, all of you like pretty okay with that, right? But you get a 47-year-old male doing that, <laughs> and now it looks a bit poncy, right? <laughs> that's, what, that's the judgment that comes, isn't it? Like, so, so, so if all of you saw me skipping down the aisle and food uh, down, down in a supermarket, a lot of you would have an automatic, what's that crazy guy doing, right? Wouldn't you? You would, let's, let's admit it. So the key is to allow yourself to actually feel about why is it that the child can get away with it but the adult can't? Every time you feel that you, you can let a child get away with something that you won't let yourself or another person as an adult get away with, 
there is already a disharmony in terms of emotional disharmony within you. So look at, look at that. Right? So, um, you know, two, two, li two little kids go up and have a kiss right, with each other. How do you feel? Oh. Oh. <laughs> but, me and Mary has a kiss in front of your group. How do you feel? Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary knows as well as I do that a lot of times that's not what comes. <laughs> what comes is get a room. <laughs> so why the judgment? You see, we, we got to see to, to work our way through a lot of this stuff. We've got to be really honest with ourselves. There is there is often a very very wide gap between what I would allow a child to do in my presence and feel comfortable with compared to what... Like, if the child's there scratching itself, right? <laughs> like, you allow the child to get away with that, don't you? Don't you? How many of you say, or many of you, I know many of you probably say, oh, you shouldn't do that in public or whatever, but, but most of the time we do allow it, right? But if an adult's doing the same thing, right, what do you do then? <laughs> Can you see the difference? Like, straight away we get into this judgment place of, oh, you know, it doesn't even realise, you know, there's all this stuff going on. And we need to look at why. So I'm not saying that going and scratching yourself in private places in public um, is, uh, is, it's up to you whether you do it. I'm not encouraging you to or discouraging you from it. But what I'm saying is we need to look at the disparity that we have between our treatment of the child doing it and the treatment of the adult doing it. Do you, do you follow me? And in that, you will find a lot of emotion. There's a lot of judgment in there, a lot of condescension in there, a lot of emotion in there. Allow yourself to work your way through that. Oh, I have a big fear of saying this out loud, so here goes. Yeah. Um, um, when I started working through some of my sexual shame, I found that I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get to it. So. Um, it, it went through stages for, you know, quite a few years, actually, before I started, with, with, you know, on mm -hmm. the divine love path. And it came up as lots of rage for a while, and I just shut it down because I didn't yeah. think that I should feel that way. Yeah. And then it got to the point where I explained to my husband what was going on, and then I would allow myself to be triggered, but I would... But, but then I, I would, you know, and I'd, so I'd, we'd sort of stop halfway through, you know, having sex and that sort of thing. But I couldn't, I just couldn't get there. And I started getting really terrified in the end. And so to the point where I just shut off having sex. And I thought it's just easier to not go there. But yeah. every time yeah. I could feel his sexual desire, yeah. I would go into this fear. Yeah. So I'd, you know, go down and try to start processing. But yeah. it wasn't until I actually said to him, you know what, I need to confront this. Let's just get into it. Yeah. And yeah. so um, it was like it took a whole world of courage to go there. Yeah. Um, but it was the, the terror that I had come up was just huge. And, and, and it took me a few... Oh, he thought it was wonderful sex on tap but it took me a few times to actually get down to what it actually was yep. and it was connected to you know something that happened to me when I was quite young and it was playing doctors and nurses but I had that intellectual memory but I hadn't connected to it emotionally yep. and as soon as I went through that terror and into the grief I just mm. started getting a vision of the face and it yep. was like you were saying before about um, you know, I would never have connected that until I actually went through the emotional steps of it. And, and as hard as it was, I feel like now, like I actually enjoy sex now for the first time in probably, you know, 40 years. Yeah, of course, because you're not having shame years. every time you have it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And it was just, you know, I guess it was just that courage that actually allowed me to put myself in that position yep. rather than try to process through it without actually, you know, putting myself in that physical position yeah. and because I couldn't get there otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and what you did was great um, because, it, because the issue was there was a fear of sex and obviously you're only going to deal with this issue, fear of sex, by actually having sex and letting the fear come up and working your way through what it's about emotionally. If you avoid the sex act altogether, then how will this fear ever be dealt with? It's going to be very, very difficult to deal with it. And so... Um, for, for many people who have sexual issues and a fear of sex, the answer is to have more of it. Do you know what I mean? Like, to actually plan every day 
to plan every day to, to work your way through the issue emotionally. Does that make sense? Like, so if you're in a partnership in particular, you can do this, can't you? So, so for example, my fear of, of sex, I obviously need to going to have to work through some issues surrounding sex and what's going on, and sex is probably going to trigger it. So if I'm in a relationship and I've attracted a relationship into my life, so here I am in the relationship, what I can do now, right, is, is if the person's willing and I'm in a loving space where I'm willing to own my emotions, so I'm not going to use the man to trigger my sex stuff and then walk away, am I? Like, that would be unloving. I want to have a loving relationship here where I deal with the issue. But what I would do is I would allow myself to set up a date or something every day. And the purpose of the date was not so much to um, have sex and enjoy it, but rather to have sex and to deal with any things that stop me from enjoying it. Right? And you'll find within a month, if you did that every day, you'll have a lot of the sex issues that you've had all your life gone. Right? Lots and lots of them gone. And your, and your sex life will just dramatically improve. So many people make the joke that, you know, the male always wants it and the woman doesn't and all that. The truth is, ladies, at the end of the day, if you deal with all of the issues revolved around sex, and there are quite a lot that are multi-generational, you will want it just as much as the guy will. Right? And why wouldn't you? Like, at the end of the day, if you love a person and you fully open your heart to them and you love the, the enjoyment of sex, why wouldn't you want it as much? Why wouldn't you want it all the time? Right? There must be some emotional reasons why, if you look at it. And remember I said at the end, like, the two of us becoming one is the two of us eventually becoming one also sexually. So that means sex 24 by 7 in that state, pretty much. Like, so, so, so that's what will happen as well. We need to work our way through what I have. So when I say as a woman, I say something like, oh, the male always wants it, you know, as a joke even, I'm, I'm just telling myself an emotional injury and replaying it back to myself all the time. And, and it's not until you confront the issue that you might find it's quite an innocent thing related to getting caught playing around with someone in the backyard when you were five, you know. And, uh, and that whole thing now had created so much sexual shame that every time you connect with your desire, all of a sudden you feel so much shame that your desire just goes away. Well, I also had an affair in my marriage, AJ, and I've been working yep. through the reasons of why that happened. Yep. And I didn't even connect to that to, you know, my fear of sex either. And I had this real feeling of obligation. I always have had as a woman a feeling of obligation. Mm -hmm. And that went straight back to the, you know, if I didn't, even though I had agreed to play doctors and nurses, if I didn't do it, then I wasn't going to be liked. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was, it was more than once. It was quite a few times over, you know, a couple of years. And yep. it was like I, th I had to do it, otherwise he wouldn't like me. Yeah. So, so it's, and a, it's a bartering of sex straight away then, isn't it? Absolutely. And then a feeling of being controlled. I'm being controlled by this having to barter my sex for other for, for, for friendship. Mm. Yeah. So now that I've, I've worked through that, I still have fear of judgment about the affair, but the shame's not there anymore either. It just went away instantly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And this is the beauty of passionately desiring positive change. When you choose the subject that you know you've got the problem with and you make a positive, positive decision... Out, acting in harmony with love to deal with that subject. So it wouldn't be a positive decision for me to choose 25 different guys to deal with my issue with sex because that would also be very much out of harmony with love because obviously the way God wants us to interact sexually is by having a love relationship as well. So it's all about love in the end. So, so if I'm just having sex without love being involved, then I, I'm actually damaging myself and the other person. So obviously I wouldn't choose to work through the issue like that. But with every issue, we can choose to work through it in harmony with love of ourselves and love of the other person. And once we do that, let's say the issue is sex or any other issue, it, often you'll find that you can work through it so rapidly when you've been sitting on it for years and years and years and years without any progress. Yeah. Thank Very you. powerful experience, yeah. If we come over to Janet back there. Where is the other mic at the moment? Oh, sorry. You're absorbed, I know. <laughs> Sorry. AJ, when you were talking about standing up in front of an audience and talking, I don't have too much of a problem with that, but I have a huge problem of huge fear of just talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody when it comes to my emotions. Mm -hmm. um, my dad and I have dinner every Thursday night and the other night because I've turned vegetarian 
he, that's very confronting for him. He doesn't know what to feed me. So he sat me down, had a big long talk about how he thought that I was looking haggard and unhealthy because I wasn't eating meat and he didn't understand. And I wanted so much to be able to stand up for myself and say... I did to a certain extent, but I felt like that five-year-old child that was just about to get yelled at. Yeah. And I wasn't strong enough to really state my case firmly. Yep. But in, in the last week, I've had two other instances where I've tried to talk about my emotions to a male and even to walk up to you to talk to you about emotions or to talk to you without feeling like I'm wasting your time. So I've got this huge fear about talking to men about emotional things and I um, was trying to impress a male doing what I thought he wanted me to do so that I would get attention. I ended up bunging up my knee <laughs> and it's on the right side. So it is really, really there for me. And I've been downstairs twice today, yeah. but I'm still very, very afraid. And I don't know how to do it. I'm scared that I'm going to be projecting, that I'm going to be unloving, that I'm going to be angry when I do it. Yep. So I'm using that as an excuse not to do it. Yep, I agree. So let's look at your interaction with a male in terms of your fear and what you would do if you wanted positive change, right? So here's my fear. Here's a male. The male you're afraid of the most is? My father. Dad. Okay. So I'm afraid of that. Okay. And your dad is pretty disapproving of you a fair bit of the time. He is. Yeah. So here's me. And I'm now, I'm now, whenever I go to speak to my dad, I'm just this five-year-old child. Yes going blah, 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 and nothing comes out right and of course he then misinterprets it and thinks I'm weak and whatever else when I really have quite a strong feeling inside of myself. How do I deal with this emotion? Well firstly understand one thing and that is you're not going to deal with this emotion in one day when it was created like hundreds and hundreds of times over with your dad. So you've got to have a bit of love of yourself going all right I, 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 yeah, as long as I make the attempt every time and I, and I assess how I did every time the next time I'm going to do better. Right? So what I, what I do myself is I go like this, all right? Here's me. Let's say it's you. And what I would do is I'd raise the issue with my dad, whatever the issue is that I want to discuss. And then I go into fear. And then while I'm going into the fear, I describe to my dad what I'm actually feeling. So, Dad, I'm actually afraid of you at the moment. I'm actually afraid of you because you're so disapproving. And, you know, just say the feelings of what you actually feel. So, so, in other words, stop talking about the subject and focus on the emotion instead. So, the subject is eating meat, right? So, Dad raises the subject eating meat. I go in return back and say, oh, Dad, I'm actually feeling quite attacked by you right now. So, now I'm focusing on the emotion, <laughs> not the subject anymore, you see. Often what we try to do is go down the subject road by saying back, oh, but eating meat's this and eating meat's that, it's not loving, da, 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 da. and we're not, we're not feeling our emotion, which is I'm petrified to actually disagree with my father on this issue, you know, and I need to deal with that emotion. So, so when the person raises a subject, and by the way, every single person probably in your life is going to raise a subject, not the emotion, right? go back with the emotion. You seem to do this all the time, do you not? Like, persons ask me a question. I'm sorry, but that's not your emotion. Your emotion of dri is driving this. Something else is driving this for you. Now, you'll notice straight away, are they humble or not? You can easily see, can't you? The ones that are humble, go, oh, start, you know, start thinking about it. The ones that are not, want to have the argument. So, so straight away, you know... Straight away, you're triggering humility, you're triggering lots of different things by actually focusing on the emotion. And to be frank, the emotion is the real interaction. So your dad thinks that he can raise any subject with you and get you to do what he thinks is right because he thinks he's right, he thinks you're wrong. That's his emotion. His emotion is the woman's always wrong, the man always knows better. Huh? And this is something you've taken on very, very young and you agree with him at the moment. The man must be right. You know, he's coming across so definite and he's coming across so like, powerfully that he must be right. 
I've got, to, I've got to accept that. That's the emotion going back. I accept, Dad, that you're right. But in here you don't feel he's right. You don't feel he's right at all. So instead of focusing on the subject matter that he raises, focus on the emotion you feel as a result of what you're getting from him and see where that takes you in any interaction. And have some patience and love for yourself during it. So when you come out of it and you go, oh, gee, I just stuffed that one up. Gee, mm. there's, you know, I, you know, I should have done that differently. Yeah. What I do is I go straight back into the same situation. So I go, all right, walk back into the same situation <laughs> straight away. I don't give it any time unless I'm you know, miles and miles away. And even then, if there's a phone, you know, that's the way it's going to happen. So go back into the situation that you did feel you didn't deal with right the first time. So you know whether you felt like you did it right the other night. So if you didn't, go back again after dinner. <laughs> you know, go back again before bed. <laughs> you know, until until mm. it feels right for you. Mm. And He's, in the process, yeah. you'll deal with a lot of emotion. He cooked me. He said, "I'll cook you some vegetable soup. Seeing you, you a bit." You know, you can't walk around with your knee. So he sends it over and he's made it with beef stock. <laughs> and he's going to ask me, did you enjoy your soup? And I have been terrified as... No. I want to say to him, I'm sorry, Dad, but you put beef stock in it. And you need to say that. Yeah. You need to say what you feel because this is a part of dealing with the fear front on. Like if you passionately desire, see at the moment what's going on for you is you're just so, you're, you're back in the five-year-old child lay mm -hmm. girl feeling so afraid that dad's going to spank you for having a different opinion to him. Mm -hmm. but, but you see, you're not a five-year-old girl anymore. Yeah. You're an adult who can deal with this five-year-old emotion. Mm -hmm. The five-year-old emotion is frozen within you and it needs to be felt. But the way to feel it is actually confront the situation and feel that emotion that rises within you in that moment. So when dad comes along and projects something at you, if you're afraid of disappointing him, disappoint him. Like, and if you're afraid of disappointing him one time and, and not the next, then disappoint him the two times. Right? Like if you need to go through a whole month of disappointing him, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> if... That's what it takes to access the emotion. Yeah. Right? So, so the truth is that if he projects that he's disappointed, he's out of line. He's out of harmony with love anyway. He's a, like, he has an expectation of you as yeah. soon as he projects his disappointment. Mm. So I would keep pro d disappointing him until he no longer projects that at me. And keep breathing. And keep breathing and feel the fear of it. Now, now, after about 10 disappointments, you'll find you'll have dealt with most of your emotion, but he won't have dealt with hardly any of his, right? And mm -hmm. then after another 20 times of disappointment, he might start dealing with his rage and his anger about why he wants to still control you. And after 50 times or 60 times, he might actually get through some of that and you might be able to have a relationship. But you'll actually find, if you do it a truthful way, an honest way, that you'll get through your emotions far more rapidly than the person who's projecting it at you will. Okay. Yes. Thank you. No worries. Monique and then Ivana. I have a fear of public speaking as well. Um, yep. So my mind, I tend to go blank and out of body and I don't know what I'm saying. So I'll try and be here. Um, I'm having trouble with... Um, with the joy part, with finding the joy, um, even though I'm passionately desiring positive change, I'm finding that my processing is, is I'm praying to be humble and in my emotions all the time, feeling all my emotions truthfully all the time. So that is meaning that I'm processing a lot of my days every day and even when does when 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 I get to a causal and it release a lot of grief and 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 it's getting extremely painful these days that can I address a causal you're not addressing please <laughs> there is no point in addressing all these emotions if in the end it isn't to love yourself. 
And if loving, loving yourself means that the, if there's no joy, then there's pain. Does that make sense? No. Like, if I love myself, I will always feel a sense of joy, even in my processing. Yes. So if I'm feeling pain in my processing, then I'm not loving myself. I need to take stock of my life and start looking at why I'm driving myself this, this strongly and this, this badly, because I'm driving myself out of harmony with love. And for yourself, there's a sort of a feeling that you might miss out right, if you don't get it done now. There's also a feeling of uh, competition, feeling like it's a competition with others, right? You must, must compete. This comes from competing sisters, competing and things like that, like in terms for affection and love. And, and there's a lot of those kind of emotions for yourself that are, that are involved in why you drive yourself so harshly. So... Who's going to hook into you while you're driving yourself so harshly? Any spirit who feels like you need to be treated badly is going to hook into you treating yourself badly and now they're going to, you know, now you're going to have lots of their emotions being expressed through you as well because of the hook. Can you see that straight away there's a lot of damaging things that happen as soon as I get out of harmony with love of myself? So many of you... I often get out of harmony with love of yourself when you're emotionally processing. Right? Loving yourself means that you look after yourself. Looking after yourself, one part of loving yourself is feeling your emotions, is one part. So I must feel. The next part, though, is to love, your, to love yourself is if I notice that I'm unhappy, then I'm out of harmony with love somewhere. And usually what we're out of harmony with love with is out of harmony with treating ourselves lovingly. So my suggestion to you, Monique, is if you've got your gear over the sanctuary at the moment or something like that, yep. Yep, I'd get all my gear off of there and I'd try and find a place that's nice and comfortable, exactly the kind of place that you want for a, moment, for a little while, and learn how to love yourself and still feel your emotions rather than having to be in a place like the sanctuary to feel your emotions. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what, what's happening is that there's a lot of emotions in there of feeling like I don't love myself and I'm willing to push myself and browbeat myself and punish myself if I don't get it right. And those are very deep core emotions coming from your childhood that are there that are driving many of your actions. Does that make sense? So is I love myself, I, I know I'm skipping to the causal, but would you say that's... A causal? Uh, the causal for you is you don't. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right, see, when we're emotionally processing, we should love ourselves, but for you it's I don't yeah. love myself. Is that part of, of being getting into I really don't like who I am as a person? I, I, I yeah. hate myself. That's and, you feel, and you feel like a... Uh, I feel so disgustingly terrible in the, mm. the blackest hole that... Yep. And, yeah. and that's not loving yourself, that's even harming yourself further. Because God doesn't feel that way about you. Like God feels completely differently to what you feel about yourself. So the, so the key is to allow yourself to start acting in love towards yourself. Does that make sense, Monique? I know, I'm crying, but... But what if, say, yesterday I really had a desire to paint... Mm -hmm. And but then an emotion came up that that I felt to be loving to myself is to feel the emotion and process, and then I forego, I for I let go of painting, and and that continues to happen. I'll have a desire, but then I'll be on a beautiful bike ride, and then I'll have an emotion that comes up, so I stop to bike, stop my bike ride, and and process on the side of the road because I feel that then I get so down if I'm not processing, do you understand? If you'll get down when you're not processing in such a way that you do, the reason why is because you've, you've got a lot of these beliefs, this is you, you've got a lot of these beliefs and all of these different spirits around you and you're very mediumistic, of course, so all of these different spirits around you hook into these belief systems you have about yourself. So, so I would focus on, firstly, focus on treating myself lovingly first. Right? 
Now that means, when I say treating myself lovingly, that also does mean feeling your emotions, but, but don't stop doing loving things towards yourself. Correct. And you are. Correct. You're putting yourself in the positions that are, that are very challenging positions and not very loving to yourself, browbeating yourself into this place where you feel like you have to get it done and get it done now. I want to change and I have to change right now. It doesn't happen that way and it's not, definitely not going to happen that way while you don't love yourself. You see, part of this process is learning how to love myself. Agreed? I've got to love myself as well as learn how to love others and learn how to love God. If I don't love myself, then I'm out of harmony with God because God loves you. Like if you don't love you and God loves you, then you're in disagreement with God about the issue of, who, of whether you're worthy to be loved or not. And allow yourself to start demonstrating some love to yourself. By, so, so, so while our fears might... So the previous discussion was fear is dicta dictating my discomfort. So in other words, I, I often want to act in harmony with fear to get my comforts. Know what you need to do, Monique, is to act in harmony with love and get some comfort. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because it's the, you're doing the opposite. You're, you're, you're in a place that's totally uncomfortable, getting triggered constantly, right, all the time, not being loving to yourself. Now, we, remember, we must first act in harmony with love of yourself. So, if loving myself means not dealing with fear, so I'm not saying if you... If you had an issue with comfort and was a fear-based issue with comfort, then I would certainly go away for a week into the sanctuary on a tent and deal with the fear-based discomfort. Does that make sense? But you've been there for quite a few months now. Like yeah, four months. You've dealt with all of those things, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so now what the issue is for you is what? You're facing the issue of, I don't really love myself. I haven't learned how to love myself. I haven't learned how to really care about myself and care about my own welfare and treat myself in a loving manner and treat myself, like treat myself with the things I love doing. Right? So, so that's one thing we need to learn how to do. Thank you, AJ. Does that make sense? Now, what's happening though for yourself, is that a group of spirits are connecting you to your lack of love of self and whenever you don't feel loving towards yourself, they are actually also hooking into that and giving you some very self-punishing emotions through the process as well. So it's not very helpful for your connection with spirits either. Does that make sense? To keep doing what you're doing. So it's sort of like you feel drawn into punishing yourself. You've got to do the opposite. The average person doesn't feel drawn into punishing themselves. They feel drawn into keeping themselves comfortable. So they've got to do the opposite. Does that make sense? To trigger whatever is there. And the key is that's why a lot of my answers are not going to be the same for any person because, because it's your particular emotional condition that needs to be worked through and many of us do have this issue of not loving ourselves and many of you younger ones by the way are very hard on yourself when it comes to your emotional processing work like I've seen you be very hard on yourself and when I say younger ones all of you under 30 very hard on yourself many of you and you need to stop being so harsh and hard on yourself and learn how to love yourself it's, it's not a competition but some of those emotions will come up, obviously. And it's not a competition. It's, a, it's about a growth towards God. That's what it's about. Ivana's down the front. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to do something different today. Mm -hmm. Usually I have this massive wall up and I block out what I'm actually feeling when I'm talking to you. Yep. Um, I feel like you've been purposely triggering me. <laughs> um, because the majority I have, <laughs> in the audience probably feel that. <laughs> um, because I wanted to say something um, at the end of the last break and then I've had my hand, I kept putting my hand up, but I'm getting away from that now. Anyway, yep. I feel really like I'm not important and like it's not okay for me to... Um, speak about what I want to speak about. Yeah. Um, and I have a major emotion about not being able to talk to my dad about how I feel. Yeah. And um, so <laughs> there's like today has just been 
really good for me because so much stuff has resonated with me, like all these things that I've been thinking about lately and feeling like I need to actually talk to Dad about these things mm -hmm. instead of just trying to process on my own. And then with what Monique was saying about feeling like she has to yep. stop her bike ride, that's, uh, you know, to, pro to process, that's how, how I feel as well. I don't love myself enough to actually go ahead with my desires. Yeah. And I feel like if I don't process right here and now, then I'm not going to get anywhere. Yeah. And so, yeah. Well, let's address a few of those issues. Firstly, um, obviously, in, in amongst those emotions, there are some projections at your dad and there are some owning your own emotions. Like, how do you... You, you feel like you're not important to your father, but that actually is a covering over of an emotion. That's the sort of the, the above layer, if you like, and it actually okay. prevents you from feeling the core emotion. The same goes with not listen to. The truth is no one has to listen to and no one has to treat you as if you're important at all, even your dad. Right? The truth is that he didn't want it because if he did want to, he would do it. And you're feeling some of the pain about the fact that Dad didn't want to. He didn't want to treat you like he wanted to listen to you. He didn't want to treat you as if you were important. And then underneath that is a lot of self-beliefs, beliefs about yourself. Like, and the, in the Dad doesn't listen, it's very much the same. Like, he didn't want to listen, right? Because if he did, he would have listened and you wouldn't feel this emotion. So, so underneath that is obviously some really core emotions. To, to allow yourself to work through. Now, now, when it's coming up, if you're riding along on a bike and it's coming up, just let it come up. I keep riding. Like, like I'm driving a car. I don't pull over on the side unless it gets really bad. I just keep crying. Like, you know, Mary's been with me. Like, I've been sobbing and driving a car still. Like, it doesn't affect me driving a car. And I, and, and I just keep doing it. Like, so, you know, if, it, if I'm watching a movie... I'll get through half a movie, get triggered, go have a cry, come back, watch the rest of the movie. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Allow yourself to enjoy what you're doing as well, like, but feel your emotions as you're doing it. And again, it's not... Um, you will get through all of this, but there is an emotion saying to you that you've got to do it now, you've got to do it now, of driving yourself hard. And the emotion is actually to please... Others. Dad. Oh, why dad? Well, where's a lot of the issues with? With dad. <laughs> yeah. But I don't understand how that, how me wanting to um, process my emotions is to do with pleasing dad. Ah. You, can anyone else see how it is? Oh, okay. Can you see that? Can you so see then that if I do these things, well, then I will be important. I'll be a powerful person. I'll be good. I'll be, you know, I'll be clear of all this stuff. Dad will admire me. And actually, the driving factor isn't to actually love yourself. It's actually to please Dad, to get Dad's love. So in other words, to get Dad's love. By the way, Monique, same issue for you. Yeah. Um, um, something else um, from... From the last seminar, you said something about, um, what was it, um, an example you gave of um, oh, rage towards men. Yep. Like, just say if I um, feel angry towards men, it's not necessarily that it, it, the core issue is anger towards men, but I might be trying to please some female spirits that are with me. Um, yep. You know... Um, so I'm deciding to be angry with the man to please them sort of thing. Yeah. The truth is, though, um, that you are, have quite a bit of anger towards Dad. Like yeah. Dad hasn't listened to you. He didn't treat you as important. And all of those emotions cover over the terrible feeling that you have that actually Dad just doesn't love you. Right? And, then, and then to please Dad, you've got to do all of these things. You've got to become successful. You'll be good at what you do. You've got to... Do you know what I mean? There's always this trying that's going on. And, and with God, you don't have to try. You can give up the trying. You don't have to try anymore. You just need to let yourself feel whatever it is, that's all. You don't have to try to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, so let yourself 
let yourself see that a lot of what's driving you, Ivana, is the ma you want the male's love. But, yeah. But you don't want it the way they've already given it to you. Yeah. Um, something also that I've connected to is that um, I w um, it's like I've got this need to feel loved by a male, but then also, on the other hand, I don't want to feel loved by them as well. Yep. Like, Can you see why? Um, well, I really don't want to <laughs> say this. Um, it, will, it, will, it will help about 50% of the rest <laughs> if you do. felt very uncomfortable around dad yeah. and <laughs> being affectionate with dad I feel like I can't be affectionate with dad because it feels like a sexual thing yeah. so something that Rick helped me with um, maybe a couple of months ago was that I want love from a male but I don't because no hold on I want to feel loved by dad but then I don't because I feel like it's a sexual thing like he's projecting at me sexually yeah. um yeah. and I really I don't, I don't want to admit that and I don't want to talk to dad about that yeah yeah um my suggestion is to do both, admit it, and talk to Dad about it if you can. But you don't, again, need to to deal with the emotion necessarily here because the emotion is quite raw right within you right now. So my, for, to, to be frank, many women feel exactly the same, Ivana. Like many women, this is why many women say, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm tired of my husband wanting sex, right? Because why do they say that? Because in the end they feel like every time he wants sex, that he doesn't want them, he wants sex, you know, and this is very much about the, what happened when we were young often, where our fathers did project sexually at us at times, or spirits who were male, older spirits projected sexually while we were a child, and, and this happens, by the way, very frequently, and so we end up with these, with these deep fears of we wanting to separate with the opposite gender, who we have an attraction to in your case, we want to separate sex from love, and we want to keep them all separate. But all that, is, all that is based around the fact that there's this terrible feelings about dad and the kind of love dad's giving. Now, now your dad might not even admit to it, right? And he may have had spirits around him. He, you know, who knows? He might, be he might have been drunk at the time that he did it. There's lots of different things that go on in, a, in our childhood where, you know, there's the emotion. And, and this is something to bear in mind. There is so much um, going on around us that is emotional but not physical. So in other words, where our father did have an instant, a sort of a sexual feeling for us, but, but because it wasn't physical, he didn't touch me, I don't have a right to feel that I was violated. Does that make sense? And there's a lot going on like that where we, we actually have these feelings inside of us that we're not allowed to trust because the physical act didn't happen. Right? But the truth is, if you have the feeling something happened, because otherwise the feeling would never have entered you. Now, now, something might the something might have been not even with you. It might have been with your mother and what happened with her dad or with another man, you know what I mean, when she was a child. There could be lots of reasons for it. Yeah. The key is to go for the feeling every time. Right? So, so in your case... Stating the feeling, what the feeling is, uh, my dad was interested in, the feeling is, my dad was interested in me sexually. So every time I give dad a hug, there's this sexual feeling coming from him. Now the truth is it could be a spirit projecting that at you whenever he gives you a hug that connects to your dad through some other means. It could be your dad actually doing it. There could be lots of different things going on. But you need to trust the feeling inside of you to heal it. And so the way to trust it is to actually go into it. That, that's what I feel. What does that feel like? It feels like I'm getting violated. Da, da, da. feels like, you know, a lot of different things about me feeling like I have to please Dad, but the trouble is when I please him, I get a sexual response and I don't like that. Now, what I'm saying is 
it might not even be your father's sexual response. Yeah, I know, because there is actually sexual abuse that has run on my mother's side. Exactly. Um, and it might be a spirit connected to your father's sexual response. Yeah. Right? That the spirit projects through your father because he can. Does that make sense? Yeah. The key is to not worry about so much where it's coming from, but what do you feel as a result of, of it? Do, do you follow yeah, me? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and allow yourself to look at why you feel like, like this really strong desire to please the male. Like. Yeah, and there's also another thing that I've sort of connected with lately. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm blaming in a way, but I'll say it anyway. But I feel like I'm keeping dad's partner happy by being not having a, um, a strong, like, father-daughter relationship with my dad. Yep. So... And that was set up by your mother, by the way. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? So, do you mean, like... What often happens in... A, let's say we have a, a marriage or a partnership where there's children, male child, female child, let's say. Right? What often happens is that the, the female, if she has unhealed issues with jealousy with the opposite sex, she will create a competition with her daughter for the father's approval and acceptance. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if the father hasn't dealt with issues of jealousy and sexual attractions and things like that, or issues with judgment of an older woman in terms of sexually, he will connect with... Sorry, the, I've done this the wrong way, haven't I? <laughs> uh, in terms of the daughter, I'm saying here again, so the mother sets up a competition with the daughter, with the father. If the father hasn't dealt with his issues with the women with regard to sexual projection or with regard to feeling not close to his daughter, he had actually set up a competition as well between the two, the two of you as well, the mother and the daughter. I'm a bit confused. Um. Um, I am pretty confusing today, aren't I? Oh, uh, yeah. I um, but that's a sub-issue. So do you mean, because my dad... My dad's partner is not my mum. I know. So, oh, I know. okay. So, but it was this was all created in your childhood, though. Yeah. So, when dad and mum were together. Oh, okay. So, mum wants to be closer to me. Uh, do you mean or? No, you have a belief inside of you that if you're close to your father, that this woman is going to miss out somehow. Ah, uh, okay. Who created that belief? Yeah. There has to have been at some point a, a setup of a competition between yourself and an older woman for your father's attention. Yeah, because I was trying to intellectually work it out and I was thinking, oh, yeah, so um, it'll relate to <laughs> blah, 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 you know, yeah. because my dad's partner is not my actual mum and then I was thinking well, that means that it might not necessarily be from mum and, yeah. and all this sort of stuff, yeah. but it doesn't but work. But the truth is it's your interaction with the mother, your, fe your feelings about the woman, so yeah. it's definitely your feelings about the mother and it's related to your dad, so it's definitely your feelings about dad. So it's and like I'm in my childhood I would have been pleasing mum by not having a... Well, the problem is if mum's projecting at you jealousy about your da connection with your dad then you're now in a conundrum, right? Because now you want to have a relationship with Dad, but if you have a relationship with Dad, then Mum's disapproving of you. Yeah. But if you disconnect from your relationship with Dad, then Dad doesn't like it. Mm. So what do you do? Like you, like, and so what we finish up doing generally is siding with one parent over the other and, and doing it that way. So in your case, siding with your Mum, in other words, nursing your Mum's your mum's emotions and feelings yep. by detuning a bit your relationship with your dad. Does that make sense? And it automatically happens. And the, the thing is that they set all that up due to their unhealed issues with each other. Yeah. Right? Because if I'm healed with Mary and we have a child, then I'm not going to be jealous of my child. Mm. Yeah. This child I'm going to love is a creation of the two of us together. Now, if that child is a boy child, every time Mary puts him on the breast, I'm not going to go, oh, like I'm jealous that another man's <laughs> sucking her breast, right? <laughs> right? If I love the child, yep. like uh, it's a totally different relationship, but you'll be surprised how many men feel very jealous about that particular thing, right? And then on the other hand, like what happens when, when, the, when a girl child comes, you know, into the rela relationship? If, if mum hasn't healed her, Mary hasn't healed her, all of her emotions, then what might happen is, 
her and the child start having a competition for my affection, right? And that gets set up and straight away we're now competing for the father's affection, daddy's affection, and now I'm going to feel very disconnected to, if, I, if it was the girl, she'd be very disconnected to mum, but feel more connected with dad and Mary would also be very disconnected from me as well and, you know, there'd be lots of jealous emotions towards the child and you can see that it doesn't take long to get some emotional injuries into those, under those circumstances. And so this is what often happens is we have projections going towards the child that are set up from the lack of relationship between the parents or the type of relationship between the parents and, and then we have these kind of emotions that you're describing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I did actually, <laughs> like from the very beginning, I had something that I wanted to say, but I won't say that now. But there's just one question that I want to ask about um, the to do with animals. Um, I'm curious as to, like, you know, with, like, venomous, like, snakes and spiders and things and even, like, um, aggressive animals, like killing other animals to eat them, mm -hmm. if we all improve our soul condition on earth, will that mean that like, like the red-backed spider won't be venomous or something? Or mm. There's a quote of me saying that in the Bible actually. Oh, okay. Mm. I haven't read the Bible. Mm. But the truth is that uh, it's our soul condition that interacts with the venom and, uh, or what we call the venom of, or secretion of any plant or animal. That makes sense? And also the plants and animals create venomous conditions as a result of our soul condition. Yep. So, so th there's, a, there's a double whammy, if you like, going on with regard to plants and animals that, that uh, can easily be healed if we heal our own stuff. So when you get to be at one with God, like a, a venomous animal could easily bite you still, and though why it would want to is a different matter altogether, but it might bite you accidentally or whatever, but you wouldn't die from it because you can easily heal anything inside yep. of yourself, so you won't be afraid of it. But on top of that, any animal around you will start feeling that soul con condition and start feeling like it doesn't need to protect itself. So therefore, over a period of generations of those animals, they'll slowly become non-venomous. Now, to give you an example of this, you know the cane toad? Well, there's a version of the cane toad in China, right? But animals eat it. Whereas here, when animals eat our cane toads, what happens? They die generally, right? So why is it that the cane toad over there can be eaten by animals, but the cane toad here can't? There's got to be some reason, doesn't there? So obviously over a period of time, the toxicity of that particular animal and also the tolerance of the other animals towards it changed. And, something, and that can easily change. And what I'm saying is that it's all related to our soul condition as to how that changes. Okay, cool. And thanks for helping me challenge myself. <laughs> no worries. It's good to learn. And some good points you brought up too. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just, just relating to um, the father-daughter issue, yep. I didn't find out until I was 33 that I was the apple of my father's eye. I had no idea and I was totally stunned when I found out. So is that something that was set up by my mum? When you say um, apple of your father's eye, your dad had this feeling in him that you were beautiful. He totally admired me. Okay, but you never felt it. No. So here's, here's you. So you never felt this <coughs> coming from him? No. So the question then becomes, why would you deny a projection that's favourable? There's really only one reason, isn't there? I don't love myself. <laughs> well, no, not no. necessarily. That's the issue now, anyway. That's the issue now, but let's look at it. Oh, she hasn't got arms. <laughs> um, can you see that it has to be somehow related to my mum and my wanting her approval? If my father's willing to shower me with approval but I don't feel any of it, why would I choose to not feel any of it? I've got to have an alternative reason why I would choose to not feel any love from somebody. And the only other alternative reason is I'm hooked in to the mm. disapproval of it somehow. So give an example in a, in a real life situation. Um, do you mind if I use one of ours? Yeah. Um, if there's been times where um, I have lots and lots of approving emotions being 
given to Mary. So, so I feel large amounts of love and compassion and, and everything for Mary. But Mary, up until quite recently, hasn't been able to feel that very well. Have you? And when she, she was working through an emotion this week where she realised that one of the reasons why is because she has a deep belief in her that, she, that her soulmate doesn't love her. Right? Now, if we relate that to the daddy situation, right, if, if daddy's projecting all of these nice emotions to me as the daughter, but I have as the daughter a deep belief that the male is incapable of loving me, where would that come from? Okay. Then I'm going to reject those loving emotions, aren't I? I'm going, they're, not, they're not actually going to enter me. Right? And by the way, just as a side point, if we place that with God and the masculine and feminine side of God, can you see why we deny love from God? Because we have deep beliefs of one gender or the other not being able to love us or we're unlovable and straight away that also blocks us from God. So, yeah, in your case, yeah, that's what's happened. You, you have this feeling that you've got to get mum's approval and your mum can be quite disapproving, can she not? And your mum and dad haven't had a that close relationship really, have they? So, so... Your mum and dad not good who got a close relationship. Your mum feels quite disapproving of your father and, who's, and, you, and quite disapproving of you if you were like your father. And so, of course, you're not going to feel very good emotions, any good emotions coming from your father. Yeah. Now, um, what's the time? Because oh, I've still not talked about the two subjects I wanted to. <laughs> which, was, which was faith... Encourage. So perhaps what we need to do is extend this conversation till tomorrow and I'll talk about how faith and courage affect you exercising your passionate desire to progress. Because um, these two issues are in fact very, very important qualities to develop within yourself in order to stay on the divine love path, right? And, uh, and there are times when you deal with quite hurtful, hurt emotions and you need to be able to remember that you're going to get through them and come out the other side of them. And if you deal... Like what I remind myself constantly, and this is just something I'd like to say before we close, is that if I'm in personal pain right at this moment, it's because I'm not doing something loving. Right? I'm actually unloving in some way. So if I'm in personal pain, I've got to look at my personal pain. I've got to look at when I'm processing emotionally, I'm even talking. If I'm in personal pain, if I'm not enjoying the release, then you know the difference between enjoying the release and actually feeling like absolutely horrible, right? When you enjoy the release, you're sobbing or whatever, but you can feel that it's all leaving you. You can feel that and afterwards you feel a sense of peace. Do you not? But if you feel a sense of pain still after the cry or whatever, then what's actually happening is one of three things. Either I am not loving myself, so I'm not being loving towards myself, I'm not being loving towards others or towards God. Okay? So what I do myself is I go, all right, I'm in pain, I feel pain, I don't feel good. All right? Why? Ah, so, so yesterday, last night, I get this, I get this tear, torn muscle, which I still have, I tore this feeling of a torn muscle right across here. I'm in pain. So right at this moment, I'm not lo being loving to who? Well, in my case, it was myself. It could have been loving to... Like if I had that pain across there on my right side and I'm a woman, then it's going to be towards men. Does that make sense? So, so, so I've got this pain, and it's still there, by the way, right now. So I'm still not being loving to myself in this regard. And, I've, and I know that it's about the love of myself. There's, and the truth is that the emotion that I'm working through is all about love of self at the moment, so I understand why I've got the pain. So whenever you feel the, any pain or constant emotional pain, just stop 
and just ask yourself, what can I do to love myself right at this moment? What can I do to love myself right at this moment and to, to, so that I can change? Because if I'm not loving myself right at this moment, I am going to actually be hurting myself or others or God anyway. So I need to stay in this state where I love myself through my emotions. Now, it's pretty hard when one of those emotions is I hate my guts. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> or I hate myself. And I need to allow myself to work my way through these different things. But if I have a feeling that I don't like myself, I need to actually work against belief of that. And what I mean by that is, while I'm perfectly okay to feel that emotion, I must stop acting upon it. Do you know what I mean by that? Well, what would you do if you hated your own guts and you acted upon it? You might physically harm yourself. You might even suicide, right, um, if you act upon it. What would you do if you hated somebody else and you acted upon it? You might hit them, punch them, stab them, kick them, shoot them, right? <laughs> Many people do, right? So, so you know that that's something you can get through. So, so stop the action including if that action is towards yourself, right? Stop the action. So when I, when I notice that I'm treating myself unlovingly, all right, all right, so right, today I haven't eaten anything and I'm hungry and I'm crying. What's happening? I can say to myself, oh, I'm dealing with my emotion, it's great. But it isn't great, is it? Because I am not loving myself. Uh, I need to go and make that food. If you want to make it stay crying, that's okay. But make it. <laughs> Do it. You know, prepare the dish that's tasty for you to eat as an act of love towards yourself. Does that make sense? Like, so there's been many times I've been in the kitchen chopping away, crying, <laughs> chopping away. Right? But I didn't go stay in my room and not eat because I love myself enough to care for myself. Does that make sense? So you need to care for yourself and when you feel pain it's because most of the time that we're not doing that. Right? We're not caring for ourselves and we need to learn how to care for ourselves. One of our biggest problems that we have on this planet is everybody expects everybody else to care for them. And everyone, well I want you to care for me, you want me to care for you, nobody cares for each other and we all feel unloved. <laughs> what we need to do instead is to love ourselves. Love ourselves first and now we will have the capacity to love others. Right? Now when you love yourself, the beauty of that is God's love flows into you because you're loving yourself enough to long for God's love to flow into you. When you hate your own guts, do you think you want God's love in that moment? Don't you want instead for God to tell you how much he hates you just so that he agrees with you in some way? Right? And this is why we're not receiving divine love in that moment because we're not in agreement with God. So allow yourself to notice the pain, emotional and physical that you're in and ask yourself just, who am I lo loving? Is it myself, somebody else or God? And just ask yourself that and, and act in harmony with love in that moment. All three. <laughs> act in harmony with love in that moment. So, so all right. And, and by the way, the one that you're going to have the most trouble with is loving yourself. All right. So allow yourself to feel about that. Millie, you wanted to come in? If we have a mic. Uh, I just had an experience um, a few weeks ago and it was about like um, not loving, like learning how, trying to learn how to love myself. Yeah. And um, my father has passed and he actually came t to show me an image of myself as oh, a little two-year-old or whatever, and he projected at me the um, the adoration that he felt for me mm -hmm. uh, um, because I hadn't didn't feel that I'd felt it, and when I actually saw myself, the image of myself projected at me, and the love projected at me and I actually looked at myself and I just thought, oh, she's adorable. <laughs> mm. 
And also at that moment, um, I felt God's love as well. Yeah. And I just wanted to share that one. Yeah, that's good. It's like, um, if you think about it, imagine a two or three year old child comes up to you, right? And, and you then pick up the child, give it a smack around the face a few times, right? And say, you, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, you disgusting thing, blah, 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 and off you go. Well, this is what many of you do to yourselves. Do you understand? Many of what we do to ourselves is we pick ourselves up, this unhealed child that we have all this judgment about, and instead of just loving it and nursing it through the process of dealing with its emotions, what we do instead is we smack it around and tell it it's not doing enough. Right? We learnt that from somebody, obviously, and we need to undo that. We need to stop doing that to ourselves. We need to stop smacking ourselves around and start caring and loving for being loving towards ourselves in the process. So a lot of people would argue with you, oh, dealing with any emotions is not loving to yourself. Well, that's not true either, obviously. You need to learn to deal with all of your emotions, to be loving to yourself. But it's not loving to yourself to browbeat yourself into a place where it's a torturous process of dealing with your emotions every single day. Right? That's not loving yourself. So choose to do some things that are loving to, to yourself instead. But let's uh, continue with this subject, um, passionately desiring positive change tomorrow. And I'll talk about the issues of faith and courage and how they affect your own acceptance of the state of acting in harmony with positive emotions rather than feeling like, oh, what a drudgery this is, working through my negative law of attraction all the time. Does that make sense? So we'll deal with that tomorrow. And um, by the way, is there any mediums who want to do a bit of medium work tomorrow? Um, is there any here who want to? Because uh, if there is, I can be available at 10.30 tomorrow for any who do. There's not, so we won't. Um, what else? Oh, I wanted to thank you too for your donations. What's actually happening, uh, just briefly, what's happening is we're looking, it's looking like we'll be able to produce our DVDs and stuff for around about a dollar a piece. And uh, um, so what we're hoping to do is use um, quite a lot of the money that, you've, that you donate, about $5,000 every month, to buying 5,000 DVDs every month that are available for free. And over the coming couple of weeks, we'll be setting up the mechanisms to do all of that. We've purchased some uh, hardware that will enable us to do that. And so in the end, we'll be able to produce, we're hoping around 50 to 70,000 DVDs a year for free um, and hoping to be able to give them away. Now, I'm having a meeting uh, with some people probably next Thursday night uh, in the Gold Coast um, about, uh, about some of the mechanics of that. So there's a few people involved in the mechanics of that. But I just wanted to tell you that a lot of your donations are going to be going towards, and what I'm hoping to do is actually spend... Um, sort of to do the 5,000 DVDs and, and a couple of thousand dollars worth of books as well for free every month. So eventually my goal is to try and get as much of the divine truth out there while we've got the opportunity. Um, and so the DVDs and the books hopefully just, we'll just be giving them away constantly. And obviously if there's not the demand, we'll just back it off a little till we meet, till we get the demand right. But uh, we're hoping to be able to do that because um, we, we want to make sure that all of the stuff's available for nothing, like at all, like where people can just grab a DVD and take it with them and, and listen to them. And so we're, what we're also hoping to do is produce whole sets of them as well for anybody who's new, who's really sincere about wanting to uh, grow, give them a whole set of 50 DVDs. Here you go. <laughs> um, and, and the day that's available for free as well. So I just wanted to let you know what's happening with some of the donations that uh, the, well, the majority of the donations that you're giving at the moment um, is going towards setting up uh, things to make all of that happen. And so what we're hoping to achieve in the end is that there's a fairly large distribution of divine truth uh, before any earth changes occur. And... Uh, and obviously, um, a lot of the things we're doing now is to just make sure that the divine truth gets out there through the law of attraction and through this free process. 
In the end, there will also be, uh, we're looking at setting up a, uh, as part of the website, setting up sort of like a purchasing system on the website. It's not going to be for money. You just order, you just order the DVDs you want and you get them sent to you. But um, what we want to do, obviously, is keep the cost down of that. So if you do come along to the groups, it's better to pick up the DVDs here than have them sent to you. Because obviously getting sent to you is the additional cost of you know, mailing and, and, and all of the packaging and all those kind of things. So what we're hoping to achieve, um, basically, is the distribution of four to 5,000 DVDs every month um, and also uh, quite a few hundred books, if we can, every month. Um, um, th you don't have to bring them back, no. The best thing to do is to send them on. <laughs> like, so, so if you tire of a book or you don't want to watch the DVDs anymore or whatever, rather than throwing them out, if you can just give, if you want to bring them back, bring them back. But if you want to send them on to somebody who might appreciate them, we'd appreciate that you do that with them instead. You can also copy them as well. And of course you can copy them still yourself because they're all not copyrighted and they don't have any copy protection. So um, you can still copy them yourselves. But what we're trying to do is make it all available for as cheap as possible, but fairly good quality so that it's available uh, to everyone. And, uh, and there's quite a number of people, by the way, who are volunteering their time to make that happen. And what I would like to do is just take the opportunity now to thank those people uh, for their time. <laughs> So, so many of you have donated quite, uh, lot, like some of you have donated quite large funds and this is where your funds are going. And also for those that are, that are donating their time, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and, and there'll be even more going on behind the scenes. Obviously, to distribute 50 to 70,000 DVDs a year, there's going to be a lot happening behind the scenes. And all of these people are doing this out of the, their love for you and their love for the material itself. And, uh, and I just feel that that's a beautiful gift that they're giving, much of which goes totally unheralded. Um, you know, like obviously I'm the person up the front giving the presentation, but there's a lot going on where people are doing a lot of things, translating and even other things going on. People are donating funds for all of these different things. And I just wanted to show, tell you just how much uh, gratitude I feel for you uh, doing that and also my feelings are if we're all doing these things for, because of our love of God, things are just going to grow so, so, so much. And it will attract a whole group of people who really want the truth in their heart, you know. So uh, that's the idea over the coming months. So hopefully within two or three months we've got all that settled down. In the interim time there's going to be a bit of a, bit of a maybe a few weeks where you might not see a supply of DVDs for a while while we're switching everything over. Peter is still going to uh, be distributing some of the DVDs as well, so there's still that mechanism until this all unfolds. And, and that once it all unfolds, the beauty of it is that actually people who want to help can actually sit in their own home and, and send, you know, do, mail, do mailing labels for sending and all. Like, there's a lot of things we can do without even leaving our own home if we don't want to, to help the whole process occur. And I just wanted to thank the people so much who have don donated their, their money and their time to do those things. Um, it's just, I feel such a gift of love that you're giving others. And I'd like to so, so much like to thank you for that. And many of you are getting, many of those involved are getting a bit triggered by what I'm asking of them. So, uh, um, that, and that's the beauty of this process too. Remember I talked about the foundation and how it, I wanted it set up? And so in the end, our focus is going to be still dealing with our emotions, even though we're getting things done. And so sometimes you might find that there's nothing up the back uh, because one or two people were dealing with their emotions that fortnight or whatever. <laughs> and that's the way it will go for a while until we settle with a lot of these emotional things going on within ourselves. But I just wanted to let you know briefly what was going on there so that you knew what was happening uh, with your donations and, and with other people's time. Joy, you wanted to... What is your phone number, Joy? 0418. 0418. 89. 5656. And how many? We, we don't have too big a room, do we? Uh, <laughs> so we can fit about 30. Yep. Okay. So any person who really wants to be a part of that, 
is welcome to come down and if you ring Joy's number, she'll let you know where it is. I don't even know where it is at this point, so I'll have to ring her too. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for your time today and also for um, all of the help and assistance that you give both myself and Mary. And we're really looking forward to the workshops coming up as well. We're um, quite a few hundred, I think there's 160 people enrolled for them and there's about 50 or 60 people who want to come to them who haven't managed to squeeze in at this point. Um, some have been asking whether we're going overseas soon and the answer at this stage is probably not um, because we have not received the donations needed to pay for the flights that we would need to have to go overseas. So, um, and I'm wanting not the Australian Divine Love community to pay for those because I feel it needs to be driven by the desires of those people overseas. So all of your donations are going towards getting these things going in Australia um, and that's how I'd prefer it to be. Um, whereas, whereas if people want us to go overseas, well their, their donations at some point will have to uh, drive their desire for that to occur. Um, so, so that's what's happening with the funds externally. So if you have friends overseas who are asking when are we coming and so forth, at this stage, I have to send out an email to everybody, but uh, at this stage, it's not looking like we'll be going uh, for, for some time yet. So we'll just see what happens with regard to that. Anyway, you've heard enough from me today, I'm sure. Catch you later. <laughs> <laughs>